Great, now that you know about a bunch of different concentrations within software engineering, let's talk about all the other technical positions that work within the software industry but are not software engineers. Because guess what? On top of writing the code, you have to do a whole bunch of other things. You have to automate the processes around it, you have to deploy the code and maintain your production environment, you have to understand the security implications behind how you design your application. There's a whole bunch of technical positions that work around and in software without directly writing the code. But the one thing they all have in common is that they have to have a rudimentary understanding of software development and programming, otherwise it's kind of hard to do their jobs. So let's talk about some of these positions. All right, folks, welcome to the giant cluster of crap that is the tech organization. Um, to be clear, not every tech company is gonna have all of these positions, but um, a lot of these titles or positions are very common between many of the well-known or larger organizations. And, uh, you know, obviously the smaller your organization is, the more these roles are collapsed and kind of condensed. Multiple of them are condensed into one person. But as you start growing, your organization starts earning more revenue, etc., then you start to specialize and focus more on very key specific things. So if we zoom into a particular part of the chart here, this is the part that you should be just a little familiar with. Uh, I've spent the last few videos talking to you about software developers and software engineers. Now at some organizations, you also have a software architect and these are people who not, they don't just code, but they also oversee and design the uh, architecture and the overall layout and structure of a new project or organ or product, excuse me. And uh, software architects are pretty common at consultancies, for example, because every new customer you talk to, every new contract you sign is going to be a new project. And so you need to have these skilled engineers who can quickly slap together big, complex systems. Um, you also have software architects at large organizations as well, where it's important to, you know, keep track of the structure of all of these different products uh, for different software architects, etc. Again, not every org has a software architect. Sometimes the software engineer is responsible for architecture of the applications that they develop on. Um, it largely depends. This entire section of the org right here, these are people who are working on the application code. And so they're going to be writing code for the product or for the projects for their clients, etc. And then they all typically report to an engineering manager of some kind. Now, if I scooch over this way just a little bit, here you've got what's called the quality uh, organization, quality engineering. You may have heard of QA or quality assurance as well. This is going to be that team. And so um, the t this team is usually responsible for testing the application, vetting its quality, um, all of the stuff that essentially double checks things one last time to make sure that it's good before releasing into production. Now, because of the way the industry is going, because of the processes that are kind of growing and changing and, uh, you know, new new tools that are coming up, um, a lot of this is kind of going away because we are now automating our tests. We have CICD. A lot of people are actually now testing in production um, even. And so uh, quality is not as common as it used to be anymore, but it's not completely dead yet. Uh, QA testers, however, traditional QA testers who don't know anything about software development, they just, you know, run tests and then, you know, manage spreadsheets all day. Those people are not really all that in demand anymore. Um, we're typically looking at software test engineers who are software engineers that focus more on the testing, test automation, etc. And then all of those people report to a separate quality engineering manager who then works together with the engineering manager and they both report to the director of engineering. If I scoot up a little bit, you now have the security engineers. These are people who are software engineers. Um, at the least, uh, they are pretty decent at software engineering, but more importantly, they are very well versed in security fundamentals in software. And so if your company is pursuing any certifications uh, for security, these are gonna be the people who work on that. Um, these people are also working together with software engineers and platform engineers to make sure that both the platform and the product itself are secure, everything is following best practices, etc. 
This one's in slightly newer position, but I felt the need to add it anyway. This is the developer experience engineer. It's basically a DevOps engineer, um, but these are engineers who also write code, but the code they write is not the same as the code that the regular software engineer writes. Uh, these engineers are working on um, the code for the product, but the developer experience engineer is usually working on coding internal tools, internal applications that make everyone else's life easier. And so that's why they're called the developer experience engineer. Alongside them, you also have what's called the site reliability engineer, and here is the essentially the platform team. Now, it also depends. Not every company is going to have a separate platform team. Sometimes it's all condensed into a single engineering org. But for really large companies, especially for companies that have like a big SaaS product or a big web application that they um, service to their customers, like Netflix, for example, they're usually going to have a team dedicated to maintaining the platform itself. And so a site reliability engineer is an engineer who is responsible for making sure that everything is up and running is performing well and that things don't randomly crash um, and this 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 position right here is also very much related to the regular DevOps engineer the problem is that DevOps is an entire culture movement it's a very big umbrella term and so DevOps could essentially mean anything DevOps engineer could be a developer experience engineer DevOps engineer could be site reliability it just depends and so um, if you're looking at DevOps engineering jobs make sure you read the job description because you could be doing a whole bunch of different things now these three positions right here are kind of a replacement for the traditional operations engineer. Um, in the past, you used to have like a specific operations engineering position that was responsible for some of the stuff, but new practices, new tools, etc. have focused on very specific things. And so rather than straight operations engineering positions, you will usually get more specific titles that are more clear about exactly what your duty is. And so developer experience engineer is, their their responsibility is to develop tools and apps for the internal team. The site reliability engineer is very specifically responsible for making sure the site is reliable. The DevOps engineer is very specifically responsible for DevOps practices, tools, automation, etc. Now, Kind of along similar lines, you may have heard of this as well. You also have a chaos engineer. Chaos engineer is very related to the site reliability engineer, but these are basically engineers whose jobs is to essentially just screw everything up. Okay, they are developing tools, they are developing uh, platforms, etc., to essentially help the platform deal with chaos. They're very methodical about how they take systems down. They're very methodical about how random stuff comes up and breaks things. And so uh, the term chaos engineering uh, was made popular by the Netflix team because Netflix essentially gathered together um, a bunch of tools they called the simian or simian monkeys is what they call them. And um, what they do with those tools is randomly they will tear down components in their platform and then test the system's capability to adjust and f work through those sudden outages. And so that's what chaos engineering is. It's starting to become more popular with other companies as well. And so that's another position that you should be aware of. Um, kind of up here, we have like the systems engineer. These are people who work directly on the cloud components. Uh, you might have also heard of other titles that are related. Um, that's going to be like a platform engineer. That's going to be cloud engineer, etc. These are going to be people who work directly on the platform. And there's probably a lot of coding involved. But rather than directly coding the application logic for the thing that the customers interact with, these are going to be people who are developing tools, developing code that directly pertain to the infrastructure or the 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 manner in which the application runs and so that's the systems engineer uh, related uh, disciplines are going to be network engineers network administrators and IT technicians IT technicians are kind of uh, uh, kind of an odd ballpark out here because they maintain the software um, and tools and stuff that everyone uses but they don't really manage the platform or the application code and so all of these positions uh, in this section right here in the platform team report to the platform manager who then report to the director of platform and then the VP of platform if there is one. Um, again, it just depends on the company. Sometimes this entire platform uh, area over here doesn't exist. It's all collapsed under just one engineering team. And so again, depends on the company. Now, that is the entire left side of this org right here, which is the extremely technical side. These are going to be people who are uh, developing code constantly, and oh no, actually I lied, there is more. Um, 
If I skip over this section just really briefly, we have another section over here, which is going to be the data and analytics team. You may have heard this uh, previously, but this is also becoming very popular. But data analytics, data engineering, uh, machine learning, AI, etc., that's going to be a lot of what these teams work on. Now, in particular, these data teams are working on how to intelligently make use and derive uh, insights from the data they collect, as well as engineering directly the processes in which they gather that data. And so that's going to be working a lot with databases, collecting pools of data from the you know customers that are using your product and things like that and the data analysts data scientists data architects etc those are going to be the people who work to kind of do something interesting with that data whether it's visualizing it with graphs gathering key metrics to give business intelligence to the managers and directors of the company things like that so this is the data team and depending on where you work in this org right here, the data analyst and data scientist usually aren't doing as much coding. Uh, data architect might cut, touch some code, but then you definitely have database engineers, data uh, engineering managers, and data engineers in general who are going to be doing the engineering and coding side of things to help provide these data functionalities for the rest of the data team. And so that is another very technical part of this organization. And so Sandwiched between these two that I skipped over a second ago is the product team. Now this product team can be technical, but usually they're not. But the product team is usually the team that's responsible for managing, overseeing the vision of the product. And they will oversee um, and work together with the designers, for example. The designers are part of the product team, usually. And then all of them work together with the engineering team to basically gather requirements, make sure everything is uh, doable, and then they provide the vision, the roadmap, the ideas, and then the engineering team essentially contributes to that and implements these ideas in engineering. So that's the product org right there. If I skip all the way over here, we have the marketing team. I didn't really bother drawing out the marketing org because it's not really the focus of this video and this course. But yeah, you've got the marketing people and the marketing people work together with product who also work together with engineering, etc. Up here, you, here are some other positions you may have also heard of. Okay, there's the developer advocate and developer evangelist, also called technical ambassador, because some people don't like the term evangelist. Um, and so this area of the organization right here is typically what's called DevRel or developer relations. And these are people who are essentially, they're technical, they know software engineering and software development, and usually they're doing some coding of some kind, but they're more customer facing. These are gonna be people who go out and host workshops, they go to conferences, they talk to customers and uh, basically empower um, the technical community to use their company's product. And so for example, a developer advocate at Google um, on like the Firebase team is going to be creating tutorials and documentation and uh, working to produce content to help people adopt Firebase more easily. And so that's like a developer advocate. A developer angel, an evangelist or a technical ambassador kind of does a similar thing, but their focus is more on marketing the product. Um, and whereas the developer advocate is focused more on the technical community empowerment. And so all of these people together form the DevRel team. Uh, you, some companies consider developer relations as part of marketing, and so sometimes they'll report to the VP of marketing. Other times they consider this as part of business development or even customer success. And so these uh, positions in DevRel may report to either of those VPs as well. A community and partner engineer is sort of like a developer advocate, but rather than being, uh, they're less customer facing and more on the development side. And so these are going to be people who develop tools for the community to better use the product. They're going to be, you know, helping the community with better uh, practices and partnerships and stuff like that. And subsequently, the community and partner engineer is usually reporting to the VP of business development or uh, customer success. And then finally, we get to this last section of this org right here, which is going to be more on the sales side. Now, on the sales side and customer success side, you have the support engineers. Most technical SaaS organizations have products that are technical in nature and usually require, um, customers usually require help. And so you have to have a support team to basically be technical and to provide that technical support to technical people. And they'll report to a support manager who reports to a director of support, etc. And they, that all boils up to customer 
customer success. Now, alongside them is that's post sales, right? After the customer has bought your product, then you have to provide support for them. However, before they have purchased the product, if they're still prospecting, if they're still kind of curious but haven't really purchased anything yet, you then have solutions or sales engineering. Okay, these are engineers who are again technical, but their primary role is no longer really coding. It's more providing that customer facing um, interaction. And so solutions engineers and solutions architects are working with the sales people in order to, you know, do proofs of concept, do demonstrations of the product, put together, um, you know, quick applications and basically just to prove to customers that their company's product is worth buying. And all of these people work together with the sales team to report directly up to solutions manager, director of solutions, and then eventually that all boils up to VP of sales. Um, and then specifically for sales, there's also another very interesting position, um, and that's a Salesforce developer. These are people who write code, but it's code that is very specific and oriented towards uh, Salesforce. Salesforce in itself is like its own ecosystem and developing applications for Salesforce is a little bit different, um, similar but a little bit different than developing normal applications. And so you sometimes have developers in companies whose responsibilities are to develop things on Salesforce, maintain those applications, and those people would primarily report to the sales organization because the sales organization is their primary customers. Um, and so yeah, that was a run through of all the different positions in the individual contributor slot. If you zoom out, you might have noticed that there's a different colors uh, the farther in you go, and that's because the red circle is gonna be your upper management. These are gonna be your directors and your vice presidents. And then in the very center, you have your C-suite or the chiefs of every you know section, department, etc. And so you also notice that the farther in you go, the more arrows you have pointing at you. And so a lot of leadership positions are very, very difficult for this reason. Everybody around you is poking at you, asking you for this, demanding this from you, etc. And then as you can see, the CEO has it just about the worst. Um, everyone is just screwing this person over um, and okay saying screwing this person over is not is not true but um, the CEO is a very demanding position and so um, usually that's why they earn the big bucks but yeah this is the uh, a really quick overview of the technical org like the technical positions in a software company again not all of these positions are going to exist in every single company it largely depends this is just meant to provide you a high level overview and a generalization of what you can expect um, for example if you decide to work as a systems or platform engineer you can usually expect to work together with some of the folks that you see around here and then report to someone like a platform manager or engineering manager etc um, usually you're not gonna you know be a systems engineer reporting to like the marketing director or something like that that's just not how it works so yeah um, if at any time you want to kind of browse through this uh, organization chart yourself you can always visit staticvoid.dev slash tech dash org dash chart um, this is always freely available on there and then if you have any feedback you can always go to github.com slash static void academy slash complete tech org chart um, anyways, this video is starting to get a little bit long now, so I'm going to go ahead and end it here. Hopefully this has been a good rundown of all the different positions in a tech company. So as you can see, you don't have to just join a company to write code. It's just that a lot of these positions do expect you to have at least a basic or rudimentary understanding of software development um, because, well, most of these positions will do or work with software in some way, shape, or form. So yeah, this is an overview of all the different positions in a tech company maybe this gives you some ideas maybe you have some goals or some positions that you want to pursue and aim for and that is going to influence a little bit of your learning journey and that right there covers a lot of different technical positions in software. I'm not going to say all, because just like with the concentrations, I'm probably willing to bet that I missed some job titles out there who were responsible for very specific things. However, this has been a general broad view of most of the industry, and so now hopefully you're starting to understand why technology is so hard to learn. It's not as simple as just learning how to code, learn JavaScript, right? It's way more complicated than that. And so with this information, 
information, you can start to get an understanding of why the technology industry is so successful, why so many people choose to go into it, and why technology also earns a lot of money. Because some of these topics are very technical, they're kind of difficult, and they take time to learn. However, if you persevere and you take the time to study this material, you too can work a high paying job that is interesting, that gives you interesting problems to solve and provides upward as well as horizontal mobility. It's a dream job and a dream technical field for anyone who is lucky enough to love it. And so that's really the last challenge for you before we dive into learning how to program and the fundamentals. You need to decide if everything that we've discussed so far is interesting to you and if you want to join the industry. If yes, let's continue.